I would like to welcome you all to the fourth in our series uh, in um, A Day in the Life of a Leader. And our guest today is Kelvin Watson. We're very excited to have him here. I'll just give you a moment of background about the series for those of you who haven't joined us in the first three parts. Um, and then I uh, would like to introduce our guest. Um, so uh, at the School of Information at San Jose State University, where Dr. Allman and I work, uh, we have a number of advisory committees for different subject areas. And uh, Sue and I co-chair the li Library Management and Leadership Advisory Committee, of which uh, Kelvin is a member. Uh, and so one of the pieces of advice that we've been given over the past uh, um, several months is that uh, graduating um, students from the MLS program and uh, uh, librarians new to their careers often don't expect that they'll be uh, applying for and participating in management positions so early in their career. And there's a lot of questions about what that entails and what they can do to prepare. And so one of the ideas that the committee came up with was that we have a uh, day in the life of a leader series. So here we are. Kelvin uh, was named the Broward County's director, Lib Broward County's library director in Florida in February 2017. And prior to um, going to Broward, he was the chief operating officer and senior vice president for Queens County, uh, pardon me, Queens Library in New York City, um, one of the largest libraries I think in the country. Uh, since he came to Florida, he's launched a number of innovative initiatives such as the Veterans Connect Hotspot Program. Uh, as well as an initiative that makes digital library cards available to all Broward County public school students. He's the immediate past president of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and currently, um, uh, uh, we found out just yesterday, a member of the Public Library Association Board. He was just elected to that board as well and has recently been nominated for the Book Industry Study Group Board too. And we're all uh, crossing our fingers that he will uh, become a member of that board and represent libraries in the uh, publishing industry as well. So you can see uh, this rich background that Kelvin brings to both our committee and to today's talk, and we're thrilled to have him here. So uh, I would like to hand the microphone over to Kelvin and have you take it away. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon. Good morning. And I've been seeing some of the, uh, the folks log into the chat to see where we uh, where we're being represented. So today, my, my, my talk is going to be about um, librarians and leadership and what, you know, from a public library standpoint, some of the things that I've seen over the last uh, 20 years being in and around libraries and from multiple different ways. So as we think about the 21st century library, uh, especially here in, in, in Broward County, which is a diverse uh, area, I really focus on the people. And I think that for our profession going forward, we really have to think about the, the people and the library, not just the, the customers we serve, but the people that we that we work with and around as well. And so that's really what this conversation this afternoon is gonna be about when I talk about libraries transform. You know, the people are, come from multiple walks of life. And so it's about building, building communities. You know, ALA came out with this uh, library transform um, uh, marketing initiative a few years ago and one of the things that I talked about with my with my teams that I've had the opportunity to lead over the over the last few years has been about not just building the communities again from outside the library or transforming what the library or how the library is seen from the outside but really transforming from within how do we transform our staff how do we transform the teams? How do we transform ourselves so that we are meeting the needs of the communities that we serve? And the way to do that is to think about abandoning conventional library practices, right? So many years ago, as I said, 20 years ago, I was, I was a library book distributor salesperson. So, the, and the one thing that I would hear over and over and over again 
um, and we hear it still today is that's the way we've always done it or you know we're not looking to change we like it just the way uh, just the way we are we have been doing it and so we we and the future leaders really have to think about uh, looking at things differently cultivating um, collaborative partnerships um, within the community get outside of the physical building and work with uh, the people. Um, and it really doesn't matter what library, uh, what type of library you're, you're coming from, a public library, a school library, an academic library, special librarian, we all need to get out of our own way and start looking at things different, differently. And again, it, part of that is starting with our with ourselves. Um, and I'm one to say that I feel like I continually transform all the time. So putting the customer first, again, we, with where we are now, have a lot more digital resources than we previously had. So some of the initiatives that we've launched here at the Broward County Libraries and the library taking the lead has been to work with our transportation department. We know that people are still catching the buses here in Broward County. They are all Wi-Fi enabled. So we have 300 buses that have Wi-Fi on them. And what we've done is we've thought about our customers and said, you know, while they're on the, this long bus ride, why not offer them the library services? Why not advertise the library and connect them to the few, the Frigo Music service that the, that we that we offer, and then guess what? If they don't have a library card, let's simplify the method so that they can get a digital library card on that bus ride when they find out about our about our services. So we've really integrated programming services. We've we've initiated a lot of training all around putting the customer first. You, leveraging digital um, and and focusing on uh, the citizens that we that we serve. So how do you get there? You start with transformation. You start with that libraries transform. You use methods that have traditionally not been what libraries and libraries have talked about. One of those is being agile. Another is being adaptive third, responsive to your community. So I started using uh, Agile in my library world or my library work after my time um, that I've spent at um, a library technology company. So I used to work, I worked once upon a time for a library technology company and we built software using Agile um, methodology. So I took that same concept, so those same concepts, and said, we need to be agile in libraries. We need to stop sitting around the table trying to figure out what our customers want and get them involved. We need to take the leadership role. We need to lead. So it's not about what we want or actually what even we think we know, uh, but it's delivering to the customers what they want sooner versus then then later um dealing with uh and resolving issues um that we think uh are coming and again hearing from and hearing from the customers so a couple of weeks ago i had a meeting with um some advocates for the visually impaired because i wanted to hear from them what is it that we are offering at broward county libraries but more specifically, what aren't we offering to serve the needs of the visually impaired community? So it's, it's taking, that, taking that approach. So if you've never heard about Agile or you're not familiar with Agile, um, some Agile lean strategies that I wanted to share today was talking to your customers, interviewing your customers. Not, and as you can see, I use customers and not patrons. I use customers because it's a, to me, it's a universal and it's a, it's a, the customer service mentality that libraries need to continue to, uh, to hone 
and 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 make better uh, and think of um, think of ourselves in the service oriented way that we that we should um, working uh, uh, working across uh, disciplines. So what I what I like to do is I like to pull people in who um, are not familiar with uh, leading projects and give them a project to to lead. So I'd give the uh, the cataloging uh, manager um, that's reported to me a uh, an opportunity to work with with the IT department to build an app so that we could um, so that we could leverage people's memories um, that they provided us in a digital in a digital way. Uh, so cross discipline training, um, issue escalation, um, teamwork. All you know, all of these things are some easy, uh, what I think, easy, uh, agile, lean strategies. Training, training, and more training. That's certainly another uh, aspect. Um, over the last year that I've been here at Broward County, we've engaged in a very robust training program for our for our staff. Um, and one way that we did this was, you know, bottom up. Bottom up, top down, listening to new employees and having them communicate directly, uh, directly to me. Another thought about transformation is is to really understand uh, what industries we are competing against. So becoming aware of existing market needs. When I go to the grocery store, when I go to 7-Eleven, when I go to Walmart, I am looking at how they are delivering customer service. And nine times out of 10, I am coming back to, um, to my library and saying, hey, how can we do this? How can we do this better? Um, I am a, a big Amazon Netflix user, so I'm always trying to learn from them as well. Um, um, you know, when I talked about the, the you know, the, uh, a few minutes ago about the, the, the music on the buses. Well, we took that same concept here at Broward County and we've now launched music at the parks. So all of our parks have uh, workout areas. And so we collaborated with our parks customers to, um, and the parks, um, uh, the parks marketing team to develop a new library service that people can access in the park while they're exercising. We also we also made it easier for people who are camping at the Broward County Parks to get a library card easier as well without having to come to a physical library. So you so you can see that we've taken things, we've looked at new ideas, we've tested them. Um, and then we've relaunched them. Um, and so what I tell my team here, and you'll see it at the bottom of the slide, is that you know, our work is never done. We continually, uh, we continually function like a, like a business. Even though we're a government entity, we really work like a business. And, and as you know, businesses are never done with, um, coming up with new ideas to serve their customers. So speaking of businesses, as you can see, don't force business processes on your users. Listen to them, learn from them, um, have focus groups, um, survey, ask them questions, um, look for ways to satisfy their needs. Stop using so many um, uh, of those uh, you know, we, we had a, a, a library app here at, at Broward County. We, we recently transitioned. And the, and the, what, and the app for our, our, serve, our books and, and our catalog was WOW, W-O-W. And so when you saw WOW, for, for one, I never knew what WOW meant or what it, what it really stood for because it had nothing to do directly with the, with the library. So, We've now transitioned to a new, to a new app and a new library card that will that literally says Broward County Libraries, which people understand. Um, 
The other thing that, that I would say is, is that you, as a, as a leader, and everybody is a leader to, to me, regardless of what role you have in, uh, in a library, in an organization, is to not be a blocker to your success. So what is a blocker? A blocker is someone who is just pessimistic, always looking for the negative, not willing to try things, not willing to, to test things, and not willing to course correct when you find out that you've tried something and it didn't work. So I wouldn't be, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't continue to focus on the do something experiment. My, my, my career has been about doing something, not being paralyzed by, by change, um, not uh, looking at, um, not looking to be perfect, but looking to provide the services that I need to provide to, pro to progress. And then if I need to course correct after we've tested something or experimented, it's okay. So I use this one, I use this one quote by John Ingram. I used to work for Ingram, uh, Ingram Book Group early in my career. And so um, and I'm still in communication with John Ingram. So I, I, I use this uh, example. John Ingram um, is, the, is the chairman and CEO of Ingram Book Group. And so as we, as we know, we've moved into a much more, more digital age. Not, uh, we're not distributing as many physical books as we used to. And so what John, what John did probably about 20 years ago was he said, I think things are going to be moving in a, in a way that I won't need as much warehouse space, but I'll be printing books on demand. And so he started this little company called Lightning, um, Lightning Print. And now that company is um, doing as much or more business as the physical book distribution business used to do. So he's printing books on demand and he, he experimented and he tried to, he made some changes so that he could remain and his company could remain relevant uh, for the people that they're, that they're serving. So the anatomy of transformation, a few steps. Step one, getting the right strategic vision is critical. Um, step two, execution is the hardest part of transformation. Step three, the biggest challenge to transformation may be a leader wedded to a past or current success. And step four, take a broad view of customer demand when embarking on business transformation. So we're gonna get into the next few slides and kind of talk a little bit about each one of these steps and how you as a leader can focus on these as you start your career, as you're in the middle of your career, or as you're, as you're looking at opportunities um, in, the, in the future. So getting the right strategic vision is critical. That's, that's being able to anticipate what the customer is going to want. And again, I, when, you, uh, when you're looking at what other companies and entities are doing to service customers, that will help you craft kind of your strategic vision um, and, and, and help you move forward. So again, more people are using online resources. So my focus is how do I provide a virtual more and more virtual library services to service the needs of the people who don't want to come in the library. For the people who do want to come in the library, how do I craft a, a strategic vision to bring them in? One of the ways that we're doing it here in Broward County is I'm planning to work with Broward College and uh, Florida um, Atlantic University to build an academic success center here in the Broward County Main Library so I can bring more people in um, who are students who, who can leverage this space as well. So it's thinking strategies around, around what is happening in your area to be successful in your, in your transformation. Bringing the library to the, com to the community, as I just mentioned. So where the customers live, where they work, that is central to a customer service model 
for a library in the 21st century. And again, it, it doesn't matter if it's a school library, academic, uh, public. That's why we launched the program with the schools, for example, to offer digital library cards to all the students in Broward County. And we're also working with charter schools and private schools a, as well. And, 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 and putting some marketing, marketing behind it that the library card is the key to your, your success, whether that be a physical and or a digital card. So realigning what we've done to meet our customers' lifestyles. We also recently launched a new project as well called Library Card for Life. So anyone that's born in Broward County can actually get, uh, get a digital library card from, uh, from us. So you talk, So I, I talked about the, the strategic vision and being critical. The next critical piece is execution, uh, which to me is, the, is, is really the hardest part of any transformation. You know, many, many of us have, may or may not have experience sitting around conference rooms, talking about what we want to do, coming up with ideas and brainstorming, and then one to two years later, we're still sitting around the conference room talking about what we want to do. And it's that same, uh, talking about what we're going to do, that same topic that we were going to work on two or three years ago. And we really haven't, we haven't executed. So one of the things that I, that I leverage with, 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 with Agile is the execution. So bringing together all of those components, putting dates around it, and actually, again, getting something out that we can test and experiment on and then course correct as well. So don't, you don't have to wait um, to, uh, to you have perfection. Be the leader and execute. So I talked about the hardest part. Um, so the biggest challenge <laughs> then is that leader who doesn't, in my mind, lead. Being wedded to the past or current success. As I mentioned before, your work is never done. My work is never done. I tell my staff that all the time. Um, we know, and they, I think they're getting to understand that the work is never done and that never be happy with the, you know, the success, continue to have to, to, to to you know, reevaluate and and launch new services, work with new partners, so that you can continue to to, to move forward. Um, so, I think that I've been successful in my career is because I have not been lulled by being complacent. Um, I as and I'm never probably done with you know wanting to contribute to the success of our profession and what what libraries do and what and what I do. So again, don't be wedded to the past, don't be wedded to any current successes. Another thing that I've that I think that I've been uh, been called um, and this is in a good way is a is a is a uh, disruptor. Uh, so I would encourage you as you think about leadership and being a leader to be be disruptive think about the library as being disruptive to the community that you that you serve that you that it's the it, it's the place that people don't always think about um but the but i always want libraries to be top of mind so i'm always looking to create new business. I'm always looking to uh, be a first tester of something that a vendor is coming out with. I'm always looking to provide better and better, um, better and better customer service. And it's not always about the money, um, but being more creative. So you don't need money to offer a lot of things, uh, programming sometimes that libraries offer. So it's really about being, being creative. We did a we did a uh, a very interesting program um, this, uh, this this past December where we worked with our cultural division here in the county 
and we did um, the program was called um, actually it was a festival we, we, it was a chalk C H A L K literacy festival we brought together chalk artists who actually took books and they they drew the characters from the books on um, on the plaza outside the main library. That was the first time we had ever done this type of event um, and a really big collaboration with, with our cultural division. But we had over 5,000 people visit the library that day. And so it's really about, again, making the library the first thing that people want to do uh, and spend um, their time on the weekends, for example. So this is just a sh uh, something to share uh, when you're thinking about um, you know what what we've been known for libraries. Uh, people have thought about us as old books, uh, and that's pretty much all. But you know we're running large library systems. Um, so I, of course, worked at Queens Library, one of the top five libraries in the country, and actually um, I'm here at Broward County Libraries, and it's it's number ten out of all the public libraries in the in the country. Um, and so this is where this is where we're going. Um, and this is where we uh, have to be. We have to think about competing with Google and Amazon, uh, not for profit, but for business. And that's what leadership looks like to me in, uh, as we move forward um, and as you move forward in, in your library career. So I wanted to share some disruptor examples, um, more from the business world. Um, and, and how things have kind of changed. Um, uh, some of these places I've actually worked for. So Ingram, uh, as I mentioned, I worked for them and how they really changed the book purchasing industry. Um, um, I actually used to work for Borders Books as well. Um, and so I uh, was actually there at the height of Amazon and uh, how Borders is no longer here because uh, Amazon you know, focused on um, uh, the web, and uh, as, as you can see, they're, uh, they're moving more to, to physical stores now, which is, uh, which is something interesting uh, as well. But you have Uber and taxis. I, I take Uber all, a, a lot. <laughs> but Apple and iTunes and Microsoft and Netflix, and you can see what Tesla is doing to the car industry. So these are some examples of, you know, what disruptor examples look like. Um, and then, of course, Libraries are still here, uh, so we've got to have uh, our place as well for disrupting, um, disrupting businesses and disrupting other, um, other entities that are actually taking people away from, uh, from using the library. Step four is, is just, again, taking a broad view of customer demand. Um, Customers need solutions, not specific products or services. Um, so an example of this is, um, so I cut the cord uh, from cable about five years ago. And traditionally, I am now using um, um, Hulu and Netflix and Amazon. Those are my web, um, that's how I get my movies and things. But then, what I also use as another solution is Hoopla that we offer at the, at the library um, and encourage a lot of our customers to use Hoopla as well as, a, as an alternative solution to, um, to uh, paying for services if they, if, they can't, you know, if they can't afford to pay or they don't want to pay. That we have alternatives, that we have solutions. Um, aligning with their with their needs and again anticipating them no, nobody the parks um the parks partners that i have here in the county they didn't come to me and say hey kelvin uh we think our customers want music in the workout areas or what is it what type of library services do you think you can offer our our customers um it, it was the other way around the library anticipating that, hey, you're going to the park, you're gonna be walking the trail, you're gonna be working out, you're probably gonna be listening to music. Why can't I 
why shouldn't I offer the library music service to, to you while you're enjoying, uh, enjoying this time at the park? So that's an example of trying to anticipate some business needs or some needs of our customers um, that, that we are, uh, again, moving forward on. So one of the things I, I, I thought about when I was um, thinking about our, our talk today was going through the presentation and there's certainly some takeaways there, but I, I also wanted to hone in on some specific leader um, takeaways and what I have experienced again in multiple organizations, both, both from a library perspective, um, from a business perspective, uh, for-profit organizations. Um, I also work for the federal government. And one of the things that, that, that is always uh, relevant is the culture. And so some leader takeaways uh, that I like to share with you today is, uh, as well, is about the culture change and how that is, is leader-led. And I've had the opportunity to be a leader in multiple organizations and help affect culture change. And so stepping up um, and you know, looking at my role as a leader and saying, you know what, I'm responsible for this change. I'm responsible for implementing Agile. And, and it's gonna take you know, five years probably for us to fully be where we need to be and then taking every section by section. But the leader, a leader has to be in the mix. Um, you, you learn to lead from your respective, you know, your respective business area. So, you know, um, I am very, uh, uh, very much attuned to what's happening throughout the entire library system. So I'm learning as a leader, I get, I get the opportunity to learn a lot about a lot of different things, how we, how we do our technical services, from collection management, from metadata, digitization. Then I'm also in the IT world, um, understanding about our, our, our digital assets and our, um, and our Wi-Fi. I'm responsible for the bit for the money, so the business and accounting and paying the bills and invoices. So really learning all of those areas so that I can learn to lead when there is um, a budget cut or if there, if there is a, uh, uh, you know, another recession or if there is some new service that's coming out that's going to be um, a, a disruptor to my business, which is the library. Um, also being successful, stepping into uh, to my role, um, to actually lead the organization where I want it to be. So setting that tone, setting that example, um, and actually speaking it and walking and talking it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do when I got here was to broaden the communication. And so I immediately implemented on my fifth day here at, at Broward, said I am going to have an open door policy and people can come Anybody in the, in the organization can come and meet with me at, 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 uh, at any time. Um, and then I also set a specific day for people to meet with me um, as well. They can schedule an appointment. Why did I do that? Because that's what I want to have happen across the organization, that people feel comfortable talking to leadership and people feel comfortable talking to their managers. But the only way to really do that is to step in and do that myself. And the last last thing is don't don't feel breaking the pattern, break out of old ways of doing things. And and, and I've talked about this uh, a little while ago. And don't be you know don't be wedded to those to that to that past and what's happened before. Break out, do something different. Be be the person that brings innovation and and be the person that is not only talking about transformation, but actually doing transformation as well. So you, the leader, have enormous power to transform the culture simply by changing your behavior. So it's within you to do that. 
Um, so the last thing that I'll, that I'll leave you with before I take questions is, uh, is to never underestimate your power, the power that you have to be the leader, to, regardless of what role you have in the organization, that you yourself are a leader as well. And now, uh, and now I think we open it up for questions. Thank you so much, um, Kelvin, for the formal part of your presentation. Uh, I'd like to open it to the floor for people to ask questions. You can put your question in the chat if you'd like, and we can uh, make sure that everyone uh, hears it. We'll read it out. Um, or you can try raising your hand. Uh, I'll just leave that open for a minute. And otherwise, I think both uh, Sue and I have some questions for you too, Kelvin. So. Oh, no problem. Okay, I'm going to start if I may. Um, it's Sue. And so many questions I have um, because we didn't have time to explore everything that you mentioned, but um, I am, uh, I was trained, my mentor talked about resistance to technology and that's the, what you've called the blocker. So yeah. how do you, we know that people resist change, they block efforts. Do you have any tricks or um, strategies to get the blocker to come around? One of the things that I've done, um, Sue, now, um, and, and again, I've done some of these things throughout my, uh, throughout my career, and that's really having, and we use the word training, so we we'll use the word training loosely, but it's really having people experience the technology themselves. It's, it's, it's being able to, um, you know, understand it from a layman's point of view. So an example out that I'll give you about, so we launched this new service called the Go Chip, which is a, it's a little device where it connects to multiple, uh, tab. you can connect to multiple tablets, your phone, even your smart TV. So what I, so what I, I did, did, and what I do is I talk to people and my, my staff, like, hey, I know you have a smart TV, uh, or you're going to get a smart TV because it's around Christmas time. And here's how you connect this device to your smart TV. So I, so I make it uh, and implement ways that, it, that, that they can see technology for themselves in their own environment, not just from the library, the library perspective. Does it make sense? Yeah, I had to unmute myself. Yes, it does. Um, and I think that that's really important. Um, we want to take people's questions now, too. And there's one in the chat. It's how do you evaluate what services to continue, what to change, what to abandon after your experimentation? So the evaluation is done in multiple, multiple ways. Uh, one is really just looking at the data. So I'm, I'm, I'm big on, uh, on, on having the data and understanding the usage. And sometimes, sometimes there's low usage and I'm looking for not the problem, but the solution and or the challenge. So when there is something that needs to continue, all right? So sometimes it's based on money, sometimes it's based on data usage. Um, we make decisions that way. Uh, what to change, the change we learn about uh, what it is we uh, want to change or we hear information from, again, we leverage data, we leverage the surveys, we talk to our customers so we can figure out what it is that we need to, um, you know, what do we need to change or how do we need to change it? So for example, we, we started lending, um, we started lending tablets here at Broward County. I also loaned tablets to customers in Queens. Had different experiences in both, both, uh, both areas actually. In Broward, we put a few more restrictions on the tablet than I did in, in, in Queens. And so what we, what we had to do is we adjusted and said, you know, maybe we're wanting the customers to come to the library when we really need to go out to the schools more. And we need to talk to parents more about using these tablets. And we also maybe need to look at expanding it from, we were doing it at one location, and now we're gonna be doing it from three locations. So it's, but I only knew that because 
or, or felt like you know we had enough data to do that was after we we sat down and, and did the an, you know analyze you know abandoning things you know that's uh, we you know that's also kind of the same the same way you 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 make decisions as a leader and you and you weigh um, you you weigh your return on investment so that's how what I would say is um, that's how I would answer that question as well so the return on investment and that could be that's not just financial that's also that's also about the time and energy exerted into you know, a, a program or service that you may or may not want to be doing. Um, then there's another question. Uh, oh, letting, uh, I, I, can I just say, I put in the chat, Letting Go of Legacy Services is a book that oh. um, people might be interested in. And it was written by two of my former students, uh, Mary Evangelisti and Catherine Furlong. So it goes into some of the things that you were saying, but it gives real examples of what people let go um, because you can't do everything all the time. Uh, so I would recommend that book. And then um, I'll read this out loud while you're thinking about the question, Kelvin. You talked a lot about technology. One big issue here in New Mexico is that things like the internet are not available to all people. So how do you deal with this? We want to be connected, but if most of our service area, um, they are not able to access the internet at home is difficult. So one of the ways that we've done that here, as well as uh, again in New York, was we worked with uh, we worked with I worked with T-Mobile to come up with a plan so that we could offer uh, Wi-Fi enabled tablets, but we also uh, worked out a program with them to offer mobile hotspots as well, so that when people so that people could continue to have internet access after they left the library. So we, we receive the devices, we pay nothing for the devices, and we pay a, a, a nominal service charge for, for the internet access for people. And so we've been, we've been lending out both of those devices um, since, last, um, since last summer, and that was a first for uh, a first big push for Broward uh, County, one of my first initiatives here. And again, I had this, a similar type of uh, work with a similar type service at, uh, at Queens where we, where we felt like, you know, people don't have the access, then we need to give them access. And uh, this, the, um, the telecom providers was a, was a partner for us uh, to actually uh, achieve that, at least at some, at, at some level here in, uh, in Broward as well as Queens. I'd like to add on to that or ask a question um, because you've got the different services um, with those mobile devices um, being able to have the buses, um, have library services on the buses in the parks. How do you get the information to the people, to your customers or the non-users as well, non-customers, uh, so that they know about this? Uh, sometimes it can be word of mouth. Sometimes it can be costly. It can be a campaign. You can use a variety of things. So what um, has worked best for you? So we've used those things that you've mentioned, Sue, but we've also done um, a tremendous amount of outreach <laughs> um, and physically being uh, places. Um, so a I'll give you some examples. So we, we, we have done an event here. It's a night event. It's in one of the, the lower income areas of Broward County. And it's been going on for five years. And so what I, what I added, again, thinking about from a business perspective, was we started doing outreach at the event. So the event is kind of like a party. It's like an after hours party for adults. You know, it's cultural, but we were not talking to people about the library services. We weren't signing people up for library cards, as a matter of fact. So that's something that we've implemented over the last year. The other thing that we've been doing is again, getting outside of the library ourselves and participating in the community. So I've been, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a group called SAGE, but it's a uh, LGBTQ um, 
group for seniors. And so we built a relationship with them. I've actually been a speaker at one of their at one of their meetings, and my team is actually going back this week. We had a table that that initial meeting I attended, you know, lending library cards, talking about our services. They're going back this week to actually show individuals how to use some of the services that we offer, like the digital services. So it's really all the things you talked about, the advertising, the marketing, the email, but also what works is getting outside of these buildings and actually connecting with the, with the community. Oh, I absolutely agree. That's um, you have to have the face outside of the physical building. And I teach a course in marketing and say it can be, you know, in the, the line at the grocery store where you start up a conversation just to get the information out. Well, listen, I've um, talked a lot. Cheryl, do you have questions? And I will encourage people um, to type in your last questions. We have a few more minutes. Um, so please make uh, the most of this opportunity with um, one of the most transformative leaders in the profession. You don't get this opportunity all the time. So Cheryl, I'll turn it over to you and then ask people to please um, put in your last questions in the chat. Okay, thank you, Sue. I do have a question for you, Kelvin, um, that might be relevant uh, typically with our series we've had a mix of uh, students attend as well as people who are working in the profession but I wanted to ask specifically for our students as an employer and as the head of your library uh, when you're uh, looking to hire new graduates or um, librarians who might be at the beginning of their careers what are the kinds of things that might strike you as desirable in those applicants uh, when you're looking for leadership? You know, what kinds of things and experiences and uh, ways can uh, applicants practice leadership skills that will show to you that they would be good potential employees? So I would say um, very similar to uh, my career. I've had a diverse career, so I'm looking for candidates with some diversity in their, you know, in their backgrounds. Uh, you know, if you have been uh, volunteering um, as well as, you know, working in a library, but learning something that was different than your library type work, if it makes sense, Cheryl. So it's, so I like, I like people who bring different ideas to the table because they've had experiences uh, they've worked in bookstores they have worked for borders they've uh, worked at different uh, places or again volu volunteer they were the church treasurer for example I mean so I like those types of skills not just that you know I want to work in the library and I want to be an archivist and I want to be the head of digitization, um, you're, you're going to you strike a better, um, you'd be the, uh, uh, the best candidate for me is one who has uh, some multiple experiences that they can bring and are interested in multiple uh, gaining experience as well. I'll, I'll, I'll add that on too. Right, so that flexibility and um, that having shown, you know, taking on leadership regardless of the setting prior to applying to the library. It's, uh, yeah. I totally agree, yeah. Uh, we have a question from, uh, a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is, I like your statement, change is leader-led in your career. Who you look to, uh, whose behavior that you strive to model? <laughs> wow, so, that I've had I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of uh, a lot of great leaders, a lot of good leaders. Um, so my I initially started my career in the military, so I look to uh, those types of individuals. You know, Colin Powell is one. I just recently read a read a book by a gentleman L uh, L David uh, Marquette Marquette who wrote a book called Turn the Ship Around. Um, and so not that I'm promoting the book, but it, it's a good, it's a military focused book on, on the Navy um, and how he was part of the Navy and he helped via his leadership to change how the operations were done um, and how after that, the people under him, the leaders under him 
went on to have very successful careers as well. So I, I look for, you know, I've, I've had those, John Ingram is one, another um, uh, that comes to mind, again, that I've had the opportunity to, uh, to work for, and I, I try to model that, um, you know, type of uh, leadership. You know, I work with John, John's a billionaire, but he's a really down to earth kind of person as well. So again, I, I, I strive to follow those uh, folks. So man, I could answer, I could probably give you a list of people that I've had the opportunity to work with that have been, you know, leader led changers. Great. Uh, I think probably um, more than uh, answers the question from the uh, person in the chat there. We've got one more. I think we, this might be our last question just because we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, Nancy says that I, I recently had a young man who's a reference librarian ask how he can move up to a management or leadership position. What would you suggest he do to get recognition for those skills? So I would say, and, and again, this is these are you know these are these are the Kelvin uh, things. Is that I would say, not just trying to get recognition for, if I'm reading this right, the, I'm, I'm assuming the reference skills, and I think that it's even beyond the reference skills. I think is, um, I would say the opportunity to move up would be joining or being a part of some cross-functional teams. I would say that if there is some um, when there are programs going on and 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 there and people are looking for volunteers, that he volunteer to be a part of those uh, cross-functional teams or teams. I think that um, those round people out and 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 you get recognition by contributing, collaborating. And that's, those are the things that will help you, I, I think, when you move up into management and leadership positions. As I mentioned, I think we're going to uh, stop our questions here because we always try to start and stop on time. I, I want to um, just start our closing remarks by thanking you so much, Kelvin, for uh, not only so many different things to think about, about how we can enact leadership and become better leaders, but also for the time that you provide on the advisory committee and for suggesting this series and then being so gracious as to agree to be one of our guests as well. I think um, everyone here has certainly benefited from what you're saying, but also uh, to remind you and to remind all the participants here that we're recording this session. And uh, we know that people really enjoy downloading them um, uh, after the fact and that many other people will benefit from uh, the session today. So thank you so much um, and uh, I want to turn the mic over to Sue before we go if she has anything to add. Well I was going to say exactly what you did Cheryl. Um, Kelvin has done so much um, in his time on our leadership um, and management advisory committee to really improve our courses for our students um, but I'm also uh, going to tell people we won't send out the URL, but it will be posted on the San Jose State University School of Information website. And if you go to the top of the screen to events and look at webcasts, um, it's going to be up there. It usually takes about four or five days until we get the uh, video and transcript up. And it's on YouTube as well, our own YouTube channel. So you can either look on YouTube uh, for the School of Information at San Jose State University or come to our website for the direct link. So thank you to all of our people um, who participated today and a very big thank you uh, to Calvin for taking time out of a very busy schedule. Um, uh, very dynamic programs and uh, fabulous leadership. So uh, with Without further ado, I will turn off the recording and um, just know that we do thank everyone very much.